Yeah, being honest is a it's a big ask. If you've heard my podcast, dude, you'll know that I always tell people to get close to that mic. Yeah, because you'll have sh good shit to say. <laughs> we'll see. You won't fucking hope so, dude. <laughs> Come all this way, you, yeah, yeah. you will, mate. You well, will. It's only thirty minutes, so it's not too far. It's a disaster. <laughs> no, that's true. How you been, bro? It's been a, um, it's been a long time. Yeah, very long time. I think I saw you last two thousand eleven. Oh, so you've sat there and worked it out. Yeah. So it was that 10, 11 years ago. Eleven years. What ago, were we months. doing? Yeah, we was uh, on a great course called Self Defense for the Soul. Still to this <laughs> day, I say to Tony, that's probably the best course. Whether it's because it was new to me, this self development game. I just loved that time. The people, Tony, Paul Regan. Yeah. What a guy he was. Yeah. You should get him in here, Paul Regan. I should get him in here. He's like, honestly, he's just like make a... make a little note of that, mate. Yeah. I've got to what? say, Paul Regan's probably... Paul and Tony are probably the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing today. In fact, without shadow of a doubt, they are. You know some cool people. <clears throat> yeah, we both do. Very blessed, aren't we, <clears throat> to know those. Yes. Sorry, I always have a little panic attack that I've hit record. My first yeah. ever podcast with um, Kit DeWell, who was a mega guest to get my first one. I didn't press record. Oh, yeah. Just for you then. Terrible, mate. Felt awful. Anyway, um, yeah, we are blessed. I, I, I need good people in my life, mate. Yeah. Because it's hard. Looks like you've got them, though. Yeah. Sometimes it makes it harder because you think that they're such strong people. They do the right thing. Most of the time, from what I know, I don't know everything about everybody. But y you hang around with Jeff Thompson for an hour and you feel like you've got everything to do. You're like, fucking hell. Yeah. I'm a beginner. White belt. Here we go. Yeah. Constantly. It's like BJJ. I've just started BJJ and it's like. Yeah, I heard actually. How's that going? That's <laughs> <laughs> going. <laughs> fucking hell, mate. Honestly. <clears throat> you think you're tough and then you. There was this 22 year old blue belt there last night. Like, even if I wanted to kill him. I just couldn't have. No, that's great, he, he, was anno he was annoyingly nice guy. But yeah. but he was a little ninja. You don't need that, do you? No, mate. You I'm like, that. fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, leave me alone. I'm fucking 38, you. mate. Leave me alone. But um, yeah, <clears throat> but I love it. Good. I was saying to Pete Drummond, the guy in before you, he was a Royal Navy, ex Royal Navy, good guy. I said, I just feel at my best when I'm fighting in a healthy way. Being challenged is what, when I feel best. Yeah. <clears throat> Definitely something in that. And grappling or any sort of. Uh, Combat sport, we we'll give that I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, life's one big grapple. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, so you're probably in a better place than me. I still find it a grapple. No, I don't think. No, no I think back to what we said before. I think that self defense of the soul course them years ago. You know, I've been on many since then, and it's still one of the best. And timing's everything, isn't it? I think. But um, and what I'm saying to my girlfriend today um. When me and you first met, I remember our interactions. Okay. And I think we clashed quite a lot. Do you? Yeah. I Go on, tell me more. Yeah, so I, it's really interesting. And it's, and it's, it's evidence, isn't it, that the, that the, the process works, mm. you know, because I think <laughs> going in there, I, I, I was like, what, 27, 28. You know, Dad had a really good job, um, green job in the police service, you know, at the time. Um, black belt, everything else, and it still wasn't enough. You know, and I, I thought, right, I've got to do something more than the physical because physically I was knackered. My body was beat up, injured. It was never enough, you know. Working the doors for years and years, never enough. So, uh, yeah, and I found Tony Summers and his course. And then sitting there, I'd rather fight eight, ten people in a row rather than sit in that course. Yeah, I get you. On, on reflection. And then, yeah, meeting you and a few exercises you had to do. I remember my ego kicking in all the time. Okay, what was it about me that triggered you, man? I don't think it was about you. I think I think it was quite similar back then. Probably still are now. Don't know. In my opinion. In what regards? In I think we were. I think well, for me, I speak for me. I was full of ego. I think still you know. inside me, bro. Yeah, it's full of ego. And I remember yeah. we had a, a tr an exercise where we had to uh, give feedback on the other person. Okay. Yeah, and um, and I can't remember fully, but I remember yours had been brutal, and I was like. <laughs> that doesn't sound like me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, and you, and you were just going on and on. And I think Tony had to tell you to move on. And I was like, Phew. and that was just that was the whole point, wasn't it? Though that was the whole point of it all. Well, oh. I hope, I hope it was with good intention that I did it. I hope so. I mean, uh, when, when we talk, eleven years ago, so yeah. I was twenty-seven. 
Yeah, similar age. Mate, yeah. I didn't know fuck all at 27. No, no and again, and I laugh about it now, but my point there is, look at, I think, look at where we were then. Obviously, still lots of work always to do, you know, but that, that always makes me smile. I'm so thankful for that day, you know, and, I, and from that seeing you sort of pop up and how you've developed sort of thing, it's like, oh, it worked, the system or the, pro, the process works, doesn't it? <clears throat> I think. Well, whenever I see your name, pictures on Facebook, I have nothing but good feelings, um, which is, I don't know where they've come from because I don't know you that well, but I always get a good, when everyone says your name, it's always followed with good talk. Like you gave something off on that day that was just, yeah, maybe I laid into you so hard because I don't know, maybe I was comfortable around you or maybe I felt like I could be honest with you. I'm not sure. Some people you feel like you have to hold back and some people you don't. A good sign for me if I like someone is one, I can take the piss out of them yeah. and two, I can tell them the damn straight truth. Yeah. Or what I believe to be the truth at least. Because I don't take the piss out of people that I don't like really. No. no. Yeah. Yeah, but that was for me, that was the, the start of everything for me really. Almost like being reborn again at 27, 28. Mm. Yeah. So you got your black belt pretty early in life, right? When you say black belt, what what system was it? So just the martial arts. So uh, first standing like shotokan, a lot obsessed with that. I've done that for like twenty years, and I think called Goshin Jutsu, you know, Japanese side, which is a mix of everything. I was like early twenties when I got that, mm. and then the judo side. I didn't really get high in judo, but um, but always loved the grappling side. And so yeah, early twenties really, I got my black belts and stuff. What what's um, part of the combat did you find the toughest? So out of all those arts, which did you find the hardest? Uh, I think I think grappling is still the mo most underestimated <coughs> martial art of all time. So you're just talking about old school on the mat. Yeah, I just think yeah, I just think um, for, for, yeah, I think it's underestimated in its complexities. <clears throat> I remember grappling with a guy in Chicago once. He was really a famous guy, and um, he said grappling is the only art you can do for thirty years and still learn something new. Yeah. You know, it does feel like know, that, yeah. And it can it can intimidate you as a white belt because I'm I'm in there thinking, I know I'm not gonna learn, I know I'm not gonna ever learn everything. So, and then you start at 38, and you're like, well, if I'd have started at 20, I'd have been really good by now. And all this shit comes in your head, yeah, you know. Didn't, so. No, I know, mate. <laughs> yeah. I know, and I don't know whether that is an if that is the ego talking. <clears throat> I don't know, but it's 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 there. Do you know what I mean? It's like I wish. I wish, I wish. And you're right, I can't. But sometimes I still live in that tasty little past. I suppose it's the reason why you're doing it, isn't it? Yeah, well, I've been thinking about this too. But why are you, yeah. Well, I feel good when I'm doing it. That's good then, to take that then. It's important not to overthink things sometimes. Yeah. I think, I think what you're doing is amazing with the better man, you know, and I see the feedback you do and stuff. And Just come a bit closer to that. <coughs> yeah, mark, sorry, dude. That's all right. Um, you've got quite a quite, quite spoken guy, man. Sorry? Quiet spoken guy. Uh, thanks. <laughs> you're welcome. Depends on who you uh, ask. Yeah, <laughs> let's see if you're still quietly uh, spoken in an hour. Yeah. But no, I was saying the whole, the, the, the better man, you know, theme of it all and what I see you doing for people um, is really good and mm. amazing. Thank um, you. And um, I suppose I'm very proud of it, even though I've got no right to be, in a oh, sense, thanks, man. mate, with that. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes, though, with these things, and when we do new tasks like grappling or start something new, I think too much self-awareness I've learned and been told by a wonderful woman called Sarah Guy, my supervisor, my therapist said the same thing. You have to be really careful not to overanalyze too much because you'll miss the fruits of the of life then really especially with like training mm. as well so sometimes it's just enough to kind of yeah. enjoy it really and take nothing else from it well, I think I'm guilty of that mate to be honest in most areas of my life <coughs> I like to the books I'm reading take me quite deep and I'm not sure whether they're the right books so the latest one is the In Search of the Miraculous it's yeah. a Gurdjieff or Spensky book and yeah, I'm near deep, the end yeah deep book that yeah, and I'm like, <clears throat> is this what I need? Or do I need to go back to the basic stuff of just like, well, do you want training's good for you? Enjoy that, enjoy your life. Uh, all this working out who am I thing, I'm like, is it helping or hindering right now? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's important to have a break every now and then. A break's a good word, mate. I feel yeah. like I'm, I'm just having a little bit of a spiritual break. Because the better man, was it was an add-on. Because I was like, like you, I'd <clears> like, you know, been, I'm in good nick. Um, I was fit, I was healthy, I could run, I could lift weights, I could throw some punches. So I was like, well, outside of that, I, I'm a, my physical game is it's all right, it's neat, it's tight. 
well, emotional gain, for example, spiritual. No, this is let's add this on and make the better man part of just becoming a better person. You still start for me the, the basics. Right? I always encourage any guy to get into some kind of physical exercise. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a better place to make decisions from when you're physically fit and energized than it is if you're tired and run down. Yeah, I think well, cause obviously my main job now is a, is a counsellor um, and uh, work for a wonderful rare disease charity called Nimpic UK and I also counsel other people outside of that. But whatever the, the scope is, you know, we tend to always start with the body in mind first okay. because before you do anything else, you know, usually when people come to therapy, uh, you know, they usually come to either get more emotionally resilient to help with the problem they've got, to overcome something, um, or in pain, or all four of those, mm. really. Um, and the people I work with, with Nim and Pick, because of what the process they go through, they don't need any more emotional resilience. Um, but they tend to let other stuff go. And if they're able to hook, take your hook in to help them with the process, looking at the body is a really good starting point. So what you would know. you encourage then for someone, who, let's say someone who's like a, a pretty low point, who may feel that they don't have the energy to exercise, for example. What what are the alternatives if they want to get their body in a better place and mind? Yes, I suppose sometimes <coughs> it's working from the smoke and come backwards, isn't it? You know, <clears throat> I think I always favour like um, the, the six human needs. I don't know if you're aware of them or know them, you yeah. know. And I think those six human needs, which is usually certainty, uncertainty, significance, love and connection, um, growth and contribution, mm -hmm. you know, some usually if someone's lacking in one of those areas you know because everything we do is our brains attempt to meet one or all six of those human needs and when you sort of allow somebody to pick one of those out you can t kind not always but sometimes work back to so for a lot of it's different for everybody but the most common one for guys is significance and love and connection and so significance is about feeling important in some way to someone and i think it's not about it's not only about feeling significant but also how we go about doing that so if you and i are talking now and some guy comes in and says respect me you're like oh, fuck off mate but he pulls a weapon out on us in his head he's gone from zero to ten quite quickly in significance and it's not about significance really it's about what we think that significance will give us you know so when we when we start a grappling journey it's about what we think that will give us you know, and Anna Dovey, who's probably like, you know, a version of Jordan Peterson, you know, and I love the podcast you do. And like, what I love about that, <laughs> diverting, that's not even the tip of the iceberg. I with, know. With Alan, you know. He did a little training for me <coughs> the other day, and I was like, oh, on the podcast, you've just shown us a t tiny bit of what you. Yeah, know. so, you know, and, and it's with that, so it's, it's the perception of what we think that would give us. Okay. You know? um, and, and that just opens up so much for people, really. All those six human needs are, for me, and the climb I could do is a good basis. But the, for th for me though, that always comes back to the start of the, the physical body, because we know motion affects our emotions. You know, so moving the body mm. is is you know, and it's like even like the aspects of the whole well-being thing. It has to be a combination approach. And I think if you put bad petrol in a car, you're going to get smoke, aren't you? You know, same with eating habits and all that sort of stuff that we're aware of. And so that's where I tend to start those six human needs because sometimes I speak to people and they say, well, I say, well, I'm depressed. Okay, well, how depressed are you? In the sense that you're not engaging with people or you can't even have a shower of a morning, you know? And it's starting that simplistic kind of process of those six human needs, tap into that self-worth, that they're worth those six human needs and then go from there, really. <coughs> that self-worth one's a difficult one, right? It's a stubborn one. So I think there's a certain element of work that we will do because you know we might read the books and we might might want a better life, but underlying is the fact that we're we're not good enough and we're not worthy. So we might do the work, but it builds on a bit of a faulty foundation. And again, I spoke with Al about this. Can you really change your core beliefs? Because I was like, well, there's there's been evidence to show that you know people have had lots of therapy before and nothing's changed. Yeah, yeah. Which is scary, man. Because that's like fuck. What if you can't change who you are at your fucking root? D yeah, do you know what? So it, the past two weeks, I've had a few light bulb moments on that very thing, actually. The past two weeks, actually. And I think um, there's elements of myself that will be with me for the rest of my life. But it's accepting that and letting, letting how long it affects me shrink. 
So I don't let it affect me the whole day. It'd be two hours, then an hour, then 30 minutes, then one minute. And then it's like, it's a noticeable thing and it hits you and you carry on. Can I ask what they are? Yeah, so of course you can. You can ask me anything you like. Wicked. What are they? Yeah, so for me, um, abandonment and rejection was a big, big um, thing that only got resurfaced the past couple of years after I hit rock bottom, you know. And um, and so when I went to therapy and, and when I did my training in, in, in counselling, you know, I believe the first 15 years is the blueprint of how we're going to live our life. So what happens to us in those first 15 years is almost a blueprint. So when something happens, it will tap into those processes. You know, you have to have experiences and growth, you know, but, you know, those things in our first 15 years of our life will always be with us. Yeah. Well, that sucks, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, um, it can be. So abandonment in what, how would it show up for you, this fear of abandonment? Are we talking about relationships? Or yeah, um, yeah, relationships, um, um, you know, especially by, by females was a big one. You know, mm. if, if, I, if I didn't get a, um, a, a, I suppose, an outcome I wanted or an agreement I wanted, it would tap into kind of that little boy that you've been rejected and then you've been abandoned. And then I felt a whole nervous system kick in with that. And that caused a lot of, you know, problems in my like 30s. Dude, it's been the <coughs> essence of all my big problems. Yeah. It's the very same thing. Yeah, so what you probably find is that will be the best you, for your best of your life. Because, you know? yeah, it's strange you say that. It, it feels exactly like that. I feel like I've changed in every way possible except for that little bit. Yeah. Which isn't a little bit, it's everything. Yeah. Because it's the thing that keeps me where I am, which is single, no kids, 38 years of age. And like I say, I can grow a business. I can, but um, I still fuck relationships up mm. because of that that thing that you just spoke about. Yeah, I th how it was explained to me was like um, that you're never not going to think about whatever that cause co that that caused that feeling for you, emotion. And I remember it being explained to me by say you have to you have to leave your house on the same road every every morning. Yeah. And one day you have a car crash and turn your car over. Then you get over that, and then you still have to drive down that road. You know, there's not going to be a day in your life when you don't drive past that spot and think, "Oh, that's where I had that car crash." You know, and with time and space, you know, we tend to get better with dealing with mm. the things. And so you might drive past it for the first few months, and it really hurt, and it really in your head. But as time goes on, that feeling, you know, you, you'll notice it, but you won't stay there. It'll get less and less. That's a great analogy. Yeah. I really like that. And smaller and smaller. Those little analogies are really helpful for me when someone explains them like that. Because that makes total sense. Yeah. And I suppose it's... Um, I suppose I watched a documentary the other day and he, he called them the three aspects of... Oh, um, Stutz. Stutz, yeah. Mate, yeah. I cried at that. It's a... Uh, yeah. Beautiful. What, what an amazing... How he summed it up for his life's work. And those three aspects of reality. Pain, yeah, uncertainty, pain, uncertainty, constant, constant work. work. <laughs> That's that that going down that road and seeing that car accident. Yeah. Pain, uncertainty, and constant work. That was awesome, wasn't it? W really awesome. Isn't he a great guy? Yeah, what amazing. Stutz. amazing. Is it Stutz? Yeah, Stutz, right? Stutz, yeah. Yeah, he's Stutz. Wow, I love him. Yeah, so he's a great psychotherapist. Um, I'm glad that Jonah Hill made that documentary. Yeah, he did yeah. a good job. I loved it. It was filmed in black and white. <coughs> it was just beautiful. It was, yeah, really good. Watched it twice, made notes. And I think it demystifies therapy as well. Whoa. On that level, anyway, because I think because you've got, got the high end therapy, <coughs> which is like uh, you know, with mental health and psychosis and that side of it all, where it, you probably need clinical care, and then like the lighter end, where it's, we call it everyday life problems and everything in between. I think that documentary mm. really demystified a lot of what therapy is about. Well, it's strange. I watched it on the Sunday and had my therapy session on the Monday and. It was weird. I kind of challenged my therapist a little bit and said, I've watched this documentary about this therapist. I said, but he actually gave his client some fucking tools, which seemed really helpful. And my therapist said, I feel a bit challenged here. He said, oh, I'm going to watch it. And I haven't spoke to him. And we're speaking oh, okay. Monday. Yeah. I mean, we've got a good relate. I've been seeing him for a long time. He's very good. It's just, I think sometimes I'm hoping a therapist will give me a, an answer like say Alex if you do this like you won't need to feel that that mm. anger that you're talking about that that a, a fear of abandonment and I always think there's a there's a solution and I think what I'm learning is that that like you've just 
said perfectly that will be there yeah all the time it's just how do you not make it a fucking car crash every time you go down that road yeah does that make yeah. sense yeah it does make sense yeah and you, well, it's, it's about your habits isn't it it's about your habits I don't know is it because like my habits have changed my habits have ch- I think they've changed anyway I think they've changed but shit still crops up but like you say it might now be that the it takes a day to recover from that Rather than a week. Yeah. But the thing with relationships is, Steve, you can fuck a relationship up in five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you lose the plot, call your missus a, a, all the names under the sun, and she won't forget that in five minutes. You might be able to. Do you know what I mean? So you've got, it, it's it's a tough game because you yeah. can, yeah. But I th- also think it's a commitment and change of behavior, you know, because I did the 12 step program when I was like um, going through it and that gave me a framework to work in and one of the biggest things that I sort of hung my hat on with that framework to work in was that commitment of change of behaviour the commi- yeah know. proper commitment yeah why is it so hard to commit to give something up that's um, that, that, that you you say you you want to get rid of because it fucks your life up because you get something out of it clearly right well back, it's back to those six human needs isn't it you're mm. doing something because your brain attempts to try and meet one of those six human needs and so I say to clients sometimes, what does that give you? Well, clearly nothing. Well, it does, otherwise I don't think you would do it. Damn right. you know, I'm not saying it does you any good, yeah. but it's definitely meeting a need somewhere. A lot of the time it's from pain and fear, isn't it? But also I think there's still a lot to be said when we go past a service level on like a nervous system and biological level. You know, So I work with people. I think my sister's um, an amazing so, um, mental health nurse practitioner. And she's worked in the heavy end of mental health for a long time. Like she worked with people that you, you know, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't wish any worse enemy their experiences. And sometimes she was saying that something's happened so devastating it changes your biological response, you know, on a chemical level. Mm. And that's when a, a definitely a, what I mentioned before, a team approach is needed regarding medication, psychiatry, them support, and a whole kind of. You know, and also I think we try and wish things as well. In our head, we have a quick fix. Well, we try and f- fit exactly that. We try. We want the <coughs> yeah. fix. You know, I want this therapist to tell me what to do to stop making me f- feel these uncomfortable feelings. Um, yeah. So say, have you thought about say your therapist can't give you that tool? Does not feel angry. Mm. What then? What's going to happen? Well, I don't know. Uh, and there's a weird part of me that like um, he's just got faith in him that that just talking about it, it is helpful in itself. So he, uh, we're at this stage where like, so he, he's a psychotherapist. So we're looking at the ugly sides and we're looking at the good sides and we're seeing how they can coexist. So he's more of, of the theory of like, you don't try and eliminate and kill off all these bad things. You place them in front of you, shine a light on them so that you can have a look at them and that you can deal with them and manage them better, which makes sense to me. Because th- in my head that would be, yeah, well suppressing all this stuff can maybe result in it just blowing up later. Yeah, definitely. You know, you know, people tend to say to me, I, I want to come to therapy, but I don't want to deal with my past. I'm like, okay. Okay. And we have to, sometimes I'm thinking, well, good luck with that, because <laughs> in my experience, your past definitely shows up in your future. And that's why. And some things, though, I remember my lecturer saying, wonderful, Uncle Julie, she said, sometimes some stuff should be sealed in a box in concrete and never opened again because it wouldn't have any value. And I quite like that. How do you know what that is, though? That's where therapy comes in, I suppose, and we'll give you that. I suppose I suppose if it's causing you more turmoil or it re traumatizes you or can send you to a place where you feel you're not gonna recover from, you know, I suppose that has gotta be explored. But for the majority of Maine and for me, I think that, you know, my past definitely showed up in my future. Yeah, I can't see how it can't not. Yeah. Like my past is exa- all of my past is exactly why I'm sat here. So it's had an impact, hmm. good, bad, what, neutral, whatever you want to call it. I can't see how we can ever rule that out, but I sympathise with that. those people that say, I don't want to go back into my, past, especially yeah. the childhood shit. Because hmm. that's, uh, Tony Summers always spoke to me about the little boy. Yeah. I used to always think, Tony, man, you don't need to do all that shit. <laughs> Guess <laughs> he was right, man. Yeah. Tony he, Summers wins again. He has a habit of doing that. Yeah, and that's, so that is, like, well, it's that first 15 years, isn't it, basically? And I think sometimes when things happen when we're kids, when we're older, 
And there's an amazing deep theory called attachment theory. Yes. That sort of goes to show that when things happen to you, we try and figure out with an adult mind, but it's not what we need really. So we have to kind of honor the feelings of that little one. I know. I yeah. keep hearing this all the time, but I, I always want to tackle it with the adult mind, always. Yeah. Or I always want to grapple it out. It's control, isn't it? That's why. Yeah. So you're, you're right. Same, I'd rather grapple all day than go back to deal with little stuff as a little kid. Mm. I'd, I'd much rather fight and climb mountains. It's, yeah. It's easier. Easy. Well, yeah. It is. But it's got a shelf life, though. Sure. Definitely but isn't that crazy? Life. Yeah, it's like getting strangled by another man is easier than <laughs> dealing with your own past, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. You can always tap there, can't you? In the, uh, on the mat. You can always tap when yeah. you're on the mat. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You, you can. It's a brave thing to do, man. To Like you said, I've kind of committed myself to a life of self-development and self-discovery, so I'm kind of in it for the long run. But at the same time, I don't want it to take suck the enjoyment out of my life. Yeah, you definitely need some breaks. Yeah, because and now's yeah. a good time. I'm starting to read like what Jeff would call entry level books again for a bit. Just the, the softy soft books, reading for entertainment rather than just deep spiritual learning. Yeah, because every every session you say grappling because it's something you can relate to. And not every session has to be a massive a full blast. Full blast that does it really? No, it doesn't. In yeah. fact, it would be wise not to do that. It's wise to drill techniques, like yeah, and then put it into action. Yeah, yeah. Mate, this is life, isn't it? Yeah, and the thing is that that's the intent, isn't it? So for me now, at 39, I train, <coughs> you know, I've got some injuries, and the gym I'm in now, I've got some really good young books coming through, and now the, tr the guy called Chris Miller is an amazing scientific and technical coach, and, you know, I, I'm not going to compete with that. Yeah. You know, so it's just like, and I think uh, some world-class grapplers like Damian Meyer, he's very much like, get on the mat, roll, tap, go again enjoy and then and then just take your ego out of it you know and, sh and also I think at our age if you just train in anything just for vanity you'll really miss the other benefits that training gives you yeah I think I, I agree yeah my training's had to change and adapt and the thing I would like about the martial arts is if you're not willing to let your ego strip away people will do it for you yeah, yeah in right. that environment like imagine trying to have an ego back in the day with Matty Matty yeah, Evans even now <laughs> <laughs> Even now, yeah, if you brought yeah. it to him he, and you were yeah. training with him, he'd, he'd give it your back. Room, he'd. Matt of times I've been on the mat with Matty and Tony and other people from other places have come in and they've been shocked that they've been like tapped out by smaller, not as good people and stuff. And it's just, it's that, kind of, you you get lost in the story, don't you? Investment thinking, well, I've done this for that long now. I've been proven it's not that good. What now? And other people can go in denial and go with it, just like in other parts of life. Or they stick with it and then Alan calls it, you never want to be the over-optimist. You don't want to be the violin player on the Titanic. <laughs> you know, and I love that. Yeah. You know, it's definitely having that, oh, yeah, you don't, because that'd be more painful. I'm so glad I met Al, Al Dobby. Yeah. He's a, he's a good man. Mm -hmm. But thing, things seem to work in, in, in pendulums. Like, um, like the most violent men that I, I want to know are now the most loving and gentle. So like a Matty and a Tony and Jeff. Yeah, like they used to stamp on people's heads, and now they, now they're gonna give you a big hug and a kiss. Yeah, like, oh, it's quite extreme, the change. It, but it's quite common if you look throughout history and through our own personal behaviour, we do swing. And usually, we end up somewhere in the centre, which is like where you can become a handy individual, but you, it's under control and you you don't use it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, <coughs> there's some truth to that, definitely. I think, I think, but. The whole thing about um, I don't know what your thoughts. I think there's a stigma. So I so I run a page um, called um, Lads, Dads, and Carers for the charity. It's just for the male side of the community, because there was a a thought that you know that men find it hard to talk. They don't reach out, and the more I do stuff, I realise actually men don't find that at all. Once you start them, you can't you can't shut them up, you know. And I find it it's almost like that stigma has been about for a long time now. And so people go, oh, I mustn't, I mustn't talk then. I've not really found that, really. And when you look at all the people we admire, all of them have gone through a journey in therapy and talk. So I'm just, I'm just wondering at this time, is, is there still truth to that? As a culture, I think, you know, my dad's generation, definitely, you know. But I think our generation, I think they do reach out, just not in conventional ways. Like they'll reach out and join a grappling class or a boxing class. 
or through social media or through social media yeah, yeah. no i agree i i've been on this whole like we're still encouraging men to talk throughout a lot of mental health driven you know campaigns but like you say i feel like we're there i feel like we're talking more than ever yeah so, uh, but statistically we, we don't seem to be that much better off so i'm like well you know we're getting guys to talk people have got platforms we want to speak out on platforms mm. we've got therapy is probably more common than ever we, the, you know there's self-help books galore for me there's a higher level and that is in doing so it's behaviors but over talking yeah so yeah yeah i know that if i take a bunch of guys to snowden let's say there's 50 of us which this is what happened at the start they'll shake hands and say hello and be nice to each other but we're not going to get into any deep conversation that's fine but we'll chit chat but once they're at the top and they're exhausted and they've been through a journey together, then they'll start opening up and talking. Mm. So the, the talking will come, but it just seems to be in the opposite order of what most mainstream mental health advocates push it. So it's like talk, 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 and your life will be different. I'm like, no, no, I think it's the other way around. I think it's do some more stuff. You'll have more people to talk to that are on your line, and then you'll start opening up. That's how I see it. Yeah, I think, well, I think that talk, 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 though, what people miss out on that, though, is the, the, the relationship the relationship that's built on that. So when you walk up a mountain with your lads, you know, they've built up trust going up that mountain, I think. And that's why they talk. Because you don't trust anybody, you won't talk no matter what you do, I think. Mate, absolutely. And yeah. I think more trust comes through sharing challenging and traumatic, well, maybe not traumatic, but like a grapple. You go through something quite painful and strenuous together. Like you sweat. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You, that does get a connection going. Yeah, I it? think so. Yeah. More than just r meeting a, a random guy for a coffee, for example. Like, I mean, you went and did a good session together. We've both sweat, we've both struggled. And then we shake hands at the end and then we tap each other on the back and say, well done, man. We didn't give up. Now, 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 we're, now we're pals. Yeah. So support and trust is there, isn't it, I suppose? Like love and connection, isn't it, then? Those six human needs again. Yeah. But it's easier to form it with a dude than it is a woman. Uh, There's more at stake. That's how I feel anyway. So if me and you become pals and you and you fuck me over, I'm like, I'm going to get over that. Yeah. No problem. I'm sorry, Steve. I love you, but you, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, that's, that's all right. Yeah. A woman does it to you. The woman that you love. Maybe the mother of your kids. Maybe the love of your life. It's like, oof. It took me 20 years to find you. Yeah. But that's because they got under your skin though, isn't it though? You've become more attached, yeah. yeah you put more skin in the game. Yeah. But again, what kind of life do you lead if you don't put yourself in that position? Because what you say is then, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll skip the love. I'll skip the love because then I won't have the risk of the, the heartache. That's one way to live, yeah. It's one way. It's a, it's a strategy. It's a strategy. I'm not saying it's a good one. No, or a healthy one, no. Definitely but it's not. one, isn't it? Yeah. I don't, I don't think you can. You've got to, you've got to be vulnerable. Oh, you have to. You've got to, yeah. Well, you don't have to. Yeah, well, to love someone you do, I think. It's, ah, it's almost saying you know, to if love you, someone. If you yeah. want, if you want that connection, now I'm, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be vulnerable. I need you to be vulnerable, and with that vulnerability, that's when we can bring the best out in each other. I think. Yeah. And it, even though there's a risk of you fucking it up and hurting me, it still beats the alternative. And I agree with that theory. Yeah, doing that is so much harder than what it sounds. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. Yeah, for me anyway. Yeah, I don't know how you feel about that, but I find it harder to cross that line of, okay, let's give this a fucking good go. Yeah. That's or I can give it a good go, Steve, but it's under my rules. Let's play under my rules. You know, if we're grappling and you do five minutes and, we, you know, this mm -hmm. is how we play the rules. Okay. So you're yeah. not being vulnerable then? So you're not allowing yourself, are you? To yeah. Be not really, rules? no. No. Yeah. But it's kind of like, I think as a young man growing up, like, especially if you're, if you're an afraid kid, if you're scared of things growing up, and then you decide, I, I really need to toughen myself up because I'm scared. I'm scared to go out my house. I'm scared to try things. I'm scared to fail. I'm scared, you know, I'm scared. So what do you do? You, you go, right, okay, I can toughen myself up by doing difficult things. I'm going to go and learn how to fight. I'm going to climb mountains. And if you do that for 20 years, you know, put yourself through that, do scare, you can become quite a tough individual on one level. Yeah. What this this little boy might not have been kind of dealt with, but you've toughened, you've become a tougher man than what you were. But that sometimes can keep that vulnerability even further away because you just build some some walls up. So externally, you look strong as fuck, and you might be, you might be able to have the resilience to grind when you need to. But to be vulnerable, I think it's a completely different skill. 
Yeah, well, it's bad. I think you, you invest in something so long, and when you see actually it's not what you thought it was, you either sink with it or you kind of just carry on in denial. And so when I, I, I started working the door at 18, so my oldest lad is 18 now. I, 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 and I, to think of him on the doors, oh, it just gives me massive anxiety. It really does, you know. But he's not down that road, is he? No, God, no. no he's much more educated than me. Um, but I remember, learning, so between 16 and 18, well that, that was my journey. I've got a fight and that's where I'll be, be physically, you know, yeah. capable. And I remember going to the door and, and then seeing a lot of incidents and then sort of seeing some main guys... In fact, actually, at 16, when uh, I took on the school bullies and, and I got better at fighting, I remember copping all with one lad, i still see now, it's like a bag of feathers. I was thinking, fucking hell, this is the guy that's meant, that I'm meant to be scared of. <laughs> yeah. And I thought I'd missed him a couple of times when I held him. Because it was that. And then I felt a sense of victory, but also a sense of, oh, shit, I'm still feeling these feelings, actually. Kay. And then when I worked um, you know, on the door <coughs> and stuff, and, you know, like, quite close with the traveling community and doing things with them fighting for money and stuff and yeah because <laughs> I was at college at 18 I went to Sunny Old College and then my mum used to give me some money and what she gave me because the, the transition it was like two quid more expensive in this college than at my school and that blew my head I was like oh, I need some more money and it's I didn't mind fighting at this but I love fighting actually I really like a lot out of it because I remember sort of because like I think a few people said, it's not the physical that scared me; it's the pre-fight, the build-up of yeah. nerves that scared yeah, me the most. Yeah. You know that kind of boom from there. And I remember being being punched in the face a few times by really named geezers. Didn't you know? It's hurt more in training with Matty and stuff than it did fighting these guys. So you know the typical thing you see on TV where it's two guys with just bare knuckles, a circle of guys. Is it that kind of fighting? So yeah, so what, so what I did, I worked the door, and it was crap money to be fair, but give me a bit. But then one guy said, oh, why don't you come down the uh, back of the old tire book? And then some lads from the traveling community used to have a bit of a straightener, yeah. and used to put money in. And it was always told one fee, but the time I got around the circle, <laughs> he was left with a lot less. But that got me through like my, co <laughs> my college, yeah. yeah. And it was almost that thing actually where the physical wasn't an issue at all. So you've been around violence for a long time since you were 16 then yeah so at six so what i did when i found uh, so again great jeff thompson i found his book in waterstones when i was 15 the uh used to be called dylan's then yeah. and i used to work school i couldn't afford to buy it and i used to sit in the bookshop and read it <laughs> and then the woman was on the till used to bring me a chair to sit on and oh. a cup of tea this woman and then this woman and i read that over about, about a week and a half i used to go in on the same couple of days read it all Ah, it sort of just spoke to me, that book did, really. Was that Watch My Back or was that the fighting book? That, no, that's Watch My Back, that was. Watch, Watch My, my Back. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and at the time, he had three volumes, Watch My Back, Bouncer, and On The Door. Right. <clears throat> and I read them all. Yeah. I couldn't afford the volume. Although that's meant to then. I learned to fight. Yeah, just like that? And, uh, yeah, I got to get better at fighting. Why you did know? you want to fight? That was That's what I interpreted from that from that text, you know. Um, well, what made you pick up that book, then? Uh, so I was into martial arts. We oh. was part of the British Combat Association. Okay. You know, and um, despite all my instructors and my dad telling me about, I couldn't get this. <coughs> excuse me, this fear thing. And Jeff sort of articulated it perfectly, and so I started training four or five times a week, in like Shotokan, judo, boxing, obsessed with it. And then, <laughs> what I used to do, I used to um, local kids stand with me. A uh, place called the Glebe, it was, and there was a lot of ruffians around there. I used to walk past a gang of kids and look really geeky, so they'd say something. And sometimes I'd um, I'd steal twenty pound out of my mum's purse, fold it in my pocket so they could see it, and then that's how I used to sort of practice and stuff. So yeah, and um, so you were welcoming the fight. Yeah, so I, I used and again, I, so I used pain as a motivator, which pain is a great motivator. Mm. It's not a bit healthy one. So I used to think if I lose these twenty quid, my dad's gonna batter me if he finds out I've stole it to do this. I did that for a year and I found out a lot of people couldn't really fight. Was your dad into some form of combat sport? Yeah, my dad, yeah. So he got us into judo when I was four. You know, God, my least dad was. He took the okay. nationals. Oh, so you've been doing this since you were a very young boy then? Yeah, just yeah. The, just the, the handheld combat. And yeah. 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 And then uh, 16. Explains why you were so good when you were 15, 16 then, right? Well, yeah. So, well, yeah. So, um, yeah, and also a bit about uh, how 
people's mindset worked and stuff. How do you feel now, looking back, as the guy who used to like fight like that, like, you know, in a, um, in a circle with with no wraps on and just just fight because of the pain? Yeah, it was that actually. I just th- I just remember thinking, even in my late twenties, early thirties, thinking, "Fuck, you was in so much pain emotionally." That's why you did it. I was almost running away from the. So we'll do more to avoid pain than we will to seek pleasure, you know. And I was just literally everything I was doing was avoiding that that pain. I, c- I couldn't understand it, and that's why therapy is so important for people. I think. What was the pain you were avoiding? Uh, re- fear, rejection, and abandonment. Yeah. So to get significance, stand on the door. Yeah, yeah, your bounces are pretty yeah. significant, man. Yeah, and every job I've done since then is all about significance. Yeah, because you worked with the police as well, and, okay. and t- oh, is that sinking down? Yeah, yeah, sorry, mate, you've got the unlucky chair. Right. You think I'd have that being the fucking good <laughs> yeah. host, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, you've got selfish. some, you've got some um, CV here, dudes. So you're supporting victims of violence, natural disasters, terrorism. Expert witness. Uh, you're at Working Minds UK. You help dads and men who who have experienced loss. Yeah, so I like to think that the <coughs> need for significance has, has shifted from being significance. Because you know what, Alex, I haven't changed since I was a little kid. I, I still uh, in the pit of my stomach. I can't stand. It was 11 years old, seeing somebody in pain. I used to hate that feeling in the pit of my stomach. I've not changed that at all. That's still the same feeling I get now. Yeah. At 39. You know, I still get that. It's not, yeah, I've not changed much feeling-wise. So yeah. maybe that belief, that core belief is right, you know. Yeah, but I guess you learn how to make something good out of it, right? So... Yeah, or you can definitely take out... You can go behavioural, can't you? Rather than processing it, you know. So like Alan then. Yeah. You can go behavioural. So, yeah. Well, you know, well, that's, I think I, I've come to learn when we process too much, okay, that's when we, we, we will stay in a feeling longer. So we have to go behavioural, you know. So it's, it's, look, it's making sure, so in that documentary, everyone say, all the greats say, you have to move forward, don't you? You do, yeah, you do. I mean, I know this. Yeah, I still get <coughs> caught out. You know, I spent the last few weeks trying to think my way out of problems. And as soon as I went back to BJJ, my head's clearer now and yeah. I can make the decisions needed to move out of those problems. So it's yeah. not like BJJ solved my life or, or solved the problem. But it's, it's put me in a position to be able to make better decisions and make them. Yeah, but also if you look, if you look back at your past, I don't know your past and stuff. But like, I can guarantee there were some things happened in that first fifteen years. Yeah. When like my like Chip said to me, my therapist, why, why, how can you not be that way? How can you not be feeling how you feel? How can you not get stuck in that kind of trying to think you out of scenarios because of what happened? How should you be? I quite like that because that's giving yourself a bit of grace, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think maybe that's called <coughs> compassion. I'm not sure. I mean, maybe you've worked out that that's how a 15 year old would act if they were given the same life that you had. Like, maybe you can backtrack it like that. I still mm-hmm. find that hard to do. I'm like, well, why didn't the kid do this? Why didn't the kid do that? Could probably a kid. For sure. Yeah. For sure. But it's like I wanted to shake that little kid. So, toughen the fuck up, man. Yeah. Not very p- compassionate. Yeah. But it's weird because if there was a 14 year old struggling now, I wouldn't give him a slap around the face. i like, sort your fucking self out, man. Yeah. Come on, you know, I'll put my arm around him. In fact, when we do the climbing, I love helping the young lads up. And why, so why wouldn't you let a 15 year old now? Why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't I be that horrible? Yeah. Well, again, there's an element of like, it's not your fault. Not like it's a fault game, but what I mean is it's just like, you're fucking 14, 15, like you're struggling with something. You don't need yeah. me to beat you you up. Because it doesn't mean you've done something wrong, right? If you find yourself in a bad place in life. No, definitely not. You're not your past, <coughs> definitely. You are where you are now. Absolutely, yeah. I think. And I, th- I think the younger you are, the, the, the less free will you've got, that's for sure. So you don't put yourself in a position at seven like you're, you're placed there. Yeah. Aren't you? You don't have a say at three years old. You no, don't have a say about no, anything. Yeah. No, yeah. And I know that, you know, maybe uh, this way, well, where do you cross the line? So a seven-year-old, do they do they have a say? Not really. 15? Mm, maybe. 20? Yeah. 30? 40? You'd like to think so. 
Yeah, but that comes back then too, doesn't it? That commitment and change. If you're still doing things, because as you get older, people get less tolerant of your behaviours. Yes, they? yeah. You know? And rightly so, because because there's only a certain age when you can't use naivety as an excuse. Absolutely, you know? yeah. And so it's that kind of commitment to change your behaviour, isn't it? What yes, you, mate. You want to look at so that's very know. true. There's definitely but things you can't get away with. But also, when I work with people that experience trauma in their thirties and forties. It took me a, only this year, actually, when I went down to Robbie Holes and there's a lot of education. They physically can't help it. Mm. Like from my, and this is why biology is so important, you know. So they, they so sometimes when people experience trauma, because with therapy and counselling, there's different modalities, as you probably know, okay? And when people say, I've tried therapy, it wasn't for me, my heart sinks because I'm thinking it was probably the therapist or the modality or the timing wasn't right for you, you know? Because sometimes we just need people to reframe things for us, to set us free, you know? Um, sometimes we need a lot of things reframing, like me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is fine as well. But so, and so sometimes, um, so I work in a, in a thing called a person-centered approach. And person-centered, the, one of the godfathers of psychotherapy, Carl Rogers, he believed that the, the man himself will know the answers to his problems. And there's some definitely evidence to that. So person-centered, you give people time and space to think and feel and come up with like their you know, uh, own answers sometimes. And some tools to do that. Sometimes, though, if you experience trauma, that part of your brain that allows you to do that there's that much damage to it biologi biologically regarding cortisol, you know, um, dopamine dump, all sorts. You will not be able to articulate that. You won't be able to do it. Okay. If your life depends on it, you won't. And so that's where there's an amazing book called uh, The Body Keeps a Score. Brilliant. And it's a, he was, I've done a few of his courses. And, wow. And, and, <coughs> um, and I am just, I just can't speak after his courses, you know. So I'm thinking, sh everything we've been told almost is wrong. Talk, talk, talk. That's what I'm saying to you before, you know. I think people do talk when the environment, the relationship is catered for them, you know. Okay, so let's say you've got a middle-aged guy who yeah. has tried therapy and he's kind of no different, right? How how do you know about his, without like go, undergoing tests and medical tests, how, how would you um, differentiate like, using it as an excuse versus in the, yeah he really can't help it like how how do you analyze someone yeah so again though be, you, you get what you tolerate there don't you so if you're if a, if a family member or loved one is being that way with me despite it's probably not their fault i'm still important as well so my boundaries have to be taken to account you know so we can't allow people just to keep you know, there has to be a consequence okay so for example with you know when i went to the I, so there's things I've done in my past that I s that wouldn't be appropriate for me not to feel guilty for still now, you know, and the people I've hurt. Yeah. And going through a program, and part of that program is like trying to, um, you will apologize to someone unless it makes it worse, you know. So I went through this painful process, um, and Paul Regan got me into this process, um, and I'd go and apologize to people, okay, and that's it. And then they didn't forgive me I want to speak to yeah. <laughs> what? and then it wasn't my fault I have a problem and it starts a cycle again you know? and so it's okay so that's a consequence of actions so even though I am there's changed behaviour and doing a sorry that's a consequence so back to your point if it is their fault or it isn't we get what we tolerate don't we yes at the same time again people still have to want to have help now there's different levels in that, in my opinion, where people want help and they say, they must make the phone call. People sometimes, I don't believe anyone's broken. You might feel it, but I don't think anyone's broken. You know, Damaged, yes, definitely. And they've got to make the decision themselves. Sometimes though, you've got to literally pick up the phone for them, put it in the hand and dial the number, especially with trauma. And then there's, there's different therapies then that can, and, and medicate, because medicine gets a bad rap. Medication gets a really bad rap, you know. And, um, and yesterday someone said, I'm not going to go on meds. I'm like, well, if you was like a diabetic, you would not take insulin, would you? You know, you would still take your insulin if you're diabetic. Well, that depends. And then, on what? Well, that if I was type 2 diabetic and my doctor said, uh, look, we can, we, here, here's your insulin. However, like if you exercise and eat well, then we won't need to be dependent on this insulin. Yeah, but so but with... Med with, with 
antidepressants are that biological stuff though that it's quite good at regulating those things we need to get moving and and and, and exercise yes and changing that state sometimes yeah because if they're dead you can't help them sure and so antidepressants does save a lot of people yeah you know yeah. um and also antidepressants doesn't make you feel happier it just takes, takes you back to the personality you are yeah so if you're a pessimist it'll take you back to being a, a pessimist just less so or if you're yeah. an optimist it'll take you back being an optimist but it's not a one-stop approach is it has to be a multiple of things i think you know so the person that doesn't talk or can't talk with a trauma there's different modalities to help them and get them there you know and depending on what the trauma is you either work from the top down or the, or the bottom up you know in the sense that talking therapy first with a combination or the physical side first like the mountain walks and the supports and then the therapy you know okay so in your in the work that you do for dads and men that yeah, suffer yeah. with a lot of it's like loss isn't it so yeah bereavement and loss yeah bereavement so i mean that must take its toll on you as well right like if yeah i've got to say early on i think there was uh, that was probably not to the, the cause but it, a combination of things you know past coming in the future that, that heavy workload it does yeah. tend to to take um it can't cause it will take a hit on you. So what's you know? the, what's the typical person that you work with? So when you say loss, is it like dad who might have lost his son? Yeah. So with so with Neiman Pick, it's a, it's a rare disease and it affects children and adults. Right. You know? okay. Um, there's every case is different. You know, it's like a fingerprint. It's really unique. Yeah, what is it, Steve? I, I don't know. Yeah. So Neiman Pick, it's a, it's named after the two doctors that found it, and it's a rare um, degenerative disease, uh, and you're born with it. Um, and it comes from mum and dad will have to have like a defective gene okay. and then there's a one in four chance their child will have it and it's a rare disease so it's like a hundred and one in 110,000 people will have it you know that's how rare it is yeah um, and then it affects people at different stages so it's also called childhood dementia because some of the symptoms oh okay you know, um, that can that can can it can, that can be caused, um, and it affects them neurologically um, and sometimes um, mentally as well, um, and some people unfortunately um, die from it. And some people live long lives with it, you know. So my mom, she had it, you know. She lived till she was sixty-five. Okay. You know, um, and then the dads I work with, they they lose their children and stuff. So it's loss and bereavement. I tend oh. to specialise in like yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a tough gig, man. I mean, rewarding, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I d yeah. I, I feel privileged being part of it. I got to say, and this one, so this when we go back to tough men, you know what I mean, who would think we're tough? It all your your definition of tough. For the parents I work with, that's fucking tough, mate. That they 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 are literally to 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 pick, to go through that loss and pain and still have meaning and still give service to others selfishly. That's fucking hardcore. Yes. Stand on the door with some Neanderthal choking them out isn't you know in my opinion you know but that's very short-lived isn't it but i so when i look at them you know that's toughness that's love and that's greatness i agree and and that literally and we said before isn't it i suppose you said about that kind of you're looking at that spiritual kind of um train of it all you know sometimes you've got to get out yourself to get that i think i think sometimes trying to do the in the self development too much you find it more in contribution to others, you know. So a lot of people would say, put the books down and go and volunteer, or go and get a job in it, or do something like that, you know. And you find that drags you up, you know. Yeah, because I was just gonna say, like, I think some people they s <coughs> they suffer horrendous circumstances in life, but it's forced upon them. Like they have to be strong. I think for for the majority, and thankfully they they probably don't have to face something as terrible as that yeah so it's like would well, you then go out and actively look for things that place demand on you so that you can reach your potential like do we need more weight on our shoulders um because again i was speaking with pete before this it's like i think when you when you're in search of, for an easy life you get all the things you don't want so by volunteering perhaps by placing yourself in that environment where you're the lucky one here like you'll you should be fucking grateful like you can help and make yeah. a difference. It maybe touches your life more than the art of self-development. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, I think well, back to the six human needs again, because I think ultimately, I think serving others is the greatest power we can have. I think, I think that's it. But again, it has to be all in balance, doesn't it? And 
or a combination of those things. Yeah. You know, definitely. There's a good argument to say that to serve others, though, you need to put yourself first, right? So if I don't take care of me, myself. Well, it's, back to, it's back to the body, isn't it? That yeah. Thing, back to the body first thing you got to take yeah. care of. Yeah. And charity starts at home. And, you know, and that context, it starts from home in here. Yeah. You know. Well, we've started having this rule like inside of the better man. It's like, well, well we're going to work on us first. Like, we've got to take care of our physical body and our, you know, our mind. After that, we'll have a look at us, which is me and my my next kid, my partner, yeah. me and my partner. Then it's me and the family. And if you can get those things in a good place, then you can start going right. Me and my community, me and the people wider than my community, and we we like to work it from that that route in. So yeah, start with you yeah, and work good, outwards, because yeah, because yeah, well, if you're a mess. And you, you can't get your shit together. Like, good luck being a good partner, right? Yeah. I, I, in Buddhism, they call it white selfishness. Yes. Which I quite like, you know. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay. It's but it's so thing. not selfish when you have it in your head yeah. like that. It's intent, isn't it, behind it? It's intent. That's so I'm going to gonna work. So it might need a bit of understanding from the people around you, but I'm going to the gym. I'm doing what's good for me so that I could be good to you. Yeah. You know, this is my motivator. This is my purpose. This is my reason. Yeah. I think it's important to have that. And if you're... Some of the come. I think Al spoke about this quite a lot about the dangers of like single men who play too much on their computer games and stuff like that. It's almost like well, they don't have the us, they don't have the family. Yeah. It's like well, I'm not needed. That connection, yeah, significance again, isn't mm. it? Back to that, you know. Yeah. And, I think, and it also, it's, it's I suppose it's acceptance because what will, when people kind of lose people, they will lose the kids, you know, um, or even lose people by suicide. It's like. Um, we spend a lifetime if we're not careful trying to figure out the why, you know. And um, there's a great guy that that one of the course with called David Kessler. He's like the breathing expert, really. Okay. And um and um he he used to run breathing groups and stuff. And then he, um his own son died by suicide. Um and he encourages people that your grief needs to be witnessed or any pain you're going through needs to be witnessed, it needs to be heard, and you should be part of a group. And so when he went through that he thought what do I do now do I practice what I preach and he said I went to a group and my books were on sale next to me like and I, I went in disguise and I was just hurting on a number of levels wow. but I thought I had to practice what I preach and he comes up with the um, he worked with the one client when you get past the why of you know why is it happening you know he said um, he had a client that was uh, playing solitaire you know the yeah. computer and they said sometimes I do that to get my mind off things and when I lose I like to play it again to try and figure out if different moves can win the game. Is it? But sometimes it says no useful moves can be found. And when I read that, he went, oh, "That's just the hand I was dealt," you know. And that solitaire analogy really helped him go. There's no fruits. It is just shit and painful. And back to that kind of you know, pain, uh, uncertainty, constant work. Yeah. It's probably all we've got. And if you try to try and change all you've got, you're gonna get a lot of pain, aren't you? And we can. D- I work with people that live with pain on a daily basis. You know, like you know, I can name a number of people that how they're carrying on, I will never know, but they still are. And they can deal with pain. It's the unnecessary suffering that we can't cope with, and we put ourselves through. So that's why we need some sort of therapy framework, system, process, support. Okay. to get us through I think that's when the title to where nobody can do it on their own to move forward really fully they might do but I suppose it'd be less painful if they have support so give me an example of the difference between someone who's experiencing a lot of pain but unnecessary suffering yeah so it's obviously <coughs> you know I work with people that lose their kids and then they will go to the excesses then of going on a massive coke binge for, for like weeks on end and a lot of drink binge or having affairs left right and centre because they're in so much pain Right. And the wonder that where the life isn't getting any better, or the wondering why the pain isn't easing, you know, and they're causing more damage to the self and those around them, you know. Where does where, how do you then draw the line between empathy and <coughs> truth? Like, you know, you've lost your kids, you're in a world of pain, but this path is exactly what you need to stop doing. Like, how? how yeah, how, where's the balance there? How do you do that? How do you not have so much compassion that you go, I get it. I get why you're on cocaine. I get why you're doing this. Get I, yeah, I get what. I, I sometimes think, I don't know why people aren't on cocaine and, <laughs> yeah. and, and drink more because yeah. of how life is. Yeah. You know? Well, that's but, why I can't get my head around. Yeah, there's, some, there's some people that I, you know, that, that you know, we, 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 we hate to think 
that um, people just want to be left alone sometimes. You know, so when you say people like to talk, we have to sometimes accept that some people don't want to talk. You know, they don't want to be helped. And people, I think the biggest uh, stigma we have, we hate to think people die from mental health. Heart attack we accept, stroke we accept, old age we accept, but people, things like suicide, no. There's always ways to stop it, and there's not sometimes. And some people just don't want to be here, you know. And sometimes I remember working with an amazing mental health nurse on a ward one. I did a patient transfer job, and then this person attempted um, suicide several times. And when you look at their background, you go, fuck, you know, I can see why, you know. And yes, we should always try to stop it you know and, and and be there but it's having that kind of um allowing people that um we call it upr in counseling that you know not judging them and making choices you know so when people are kind of making their life worse it's okay well listen you can't have best of both worlds okay so as soon as you want help you let us know until then we get what we tolerate so it's about from a personal point of view Professionally, it's different because I've got to wait then to, to, to want to help. But if somebody, I remember a family member, member of mine, alcoholic, horrendous upbringing, my cousin actually, you know, and he, he took his own life. And I remember my sister saying to him, you know, and he always had an excuse for a drink, always an excuse, you know, good day, bad day, cremation. And I remember Claire saying to him, as soon as you want help, we're here for you. And then she let go then. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's quite a powerful thing to do. And that's so, and you can say empathise with them because empathy is just putting yourself in their shoes but leaving your socks on. Do people who commit suicide always have a traumatic past or an event that's sent them into a spiral, or is it sometimes what you'd call an illness from from birth? And no matter what upbringing you would have had, it's there. There's so many variables, sort of thing, and even that. So we tend to say death by suicide rather than committed suicide because the language found where people think we commit a crime, don't we? And um, I believe you know ending your pain isn't a crime you know we have to kind of honor it in a way in mm. a sense i'm no expert in it um my view there's many reasons why they do it usually usually it's done in a moment of despair you know um i know working with people that survived suicide they didn't really want to kill themselves they just wanted to not be in pain um one of the greatest sentences or again claire uses like you know when people are feeling suicidal like do you want to kill yourself or just not want to feel how you feel and they've always said you know i just don't want to feel like this anymore okay then good then we can ho hopefully change that by different ways um so yes yeah, and it's also not a selfish act it's done in the moment of despair and it's just evidence of a troubled mind really mm -hmm. um usually from pain and it could be many reasons from things like debt to a breakdown of relationship to addictions, to kind of mental health issues, to kind of paranoia. There's loads of variables in there to it all. Yeah. You know? w when you said that phrase, like some people just don't want to be here. <sighs> Sad, isn't it? Yeah. It's, yeah, it sent a shiver up my spine, that one, mate. Mm, yeah. It's qu I think a tiny bit of me can relate to it. Yeah. But it is fucking very sad. It is very sad. And I think, but also, I think, um, I, th I know only three people that have died this year by suicide. Fucking three. All you know. men. Uh yeah, all men. Yeah. Yeah. And um and one of them in particular, you wouldn't have a clue. Wouldn't have really? a oh yeah, not a chance. Those selfies and social media presence and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, and um from the outside looking in, like we see most celebrities, they've got everything to live a f fulfilled life. Um but yeah, just didn't want to be here. And and I just, you'll never, people that are in that mindset, like a friend of mine who has tried to take his life a few times, when he's in that state, he truly believes that he's be you are better off without me here. Yeah, you'll be sad for a month or two, but afterwards, your life will be better than, you know, and he, that's his belief days, you know. And I think people underestimate the hole that absence will leave, as Jordan Peterson says quite articulately. And I believe that, you know. Um, People have said to me in the past that, you know, I'll get, I'll get over it, you know. And I know, because I work with people that are left behind, you know. I'm working with people six months ago, they lost someone they love. I'm working with people that 18 years ago, they lost someone they love. And they've never got over it. 
So those struggling, don't ever underestimate the power your absence would leave. I think that's the know. hard thing, believing that, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah that we is. all count for something. Because yeah. here's the weird thing, in the long term, this is the ultimate paradox. We're not that important, right? We're one human out of nine billion or whatever it is, and in a thousand years, what we do ain't gonna count for shit. And and, and I mean that in a... Yeah, you've got to put context to it, haven't you? Yes, so, so you know, that way some people go, well, that's really freeing. I'm free, I can enjoy this life, I can do my best. Some people might see that as, well, Most no, it don't matter in a thousand years, it don't matter in 500 years, mm. it don't matter in a hundred years, it doesn't matter today. Yeah, That's the dangerous point when you're all that nihilist who thinks nothing they do does matters or counts. Yeah, I'll probably say, where's the evidence for that, though? If someone says that, I'll say, where's your evidence? For nothing matters? Yeah. You know. Well, it's always hard to win that argument because they will just say, well, in a thousand years, it won't matter. Yeah, but today, though. Today, yeah. yeah so today, though, as in, like, right here now. Yeah. You know, give me some evidence. Because I want to believe you. I'm on your side. I'm yeah. on your back, you know. But I need some evidence to back that up. Yes. You know. And then normally, as well, I tend to say, well, you know, your missus then, can she... No, 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 she's be- she great, she's beautiful. Well, you're sort of making up the rules there, aren't you, a little bit? So you've got to kind of, you know... Yeah, it was Tony that um, introduced me to the concept that sometimes suicide is also used in like revenge. Yeah. Which I'd never thought of, and it got uncomfortable just talking about it. It was like, it's the ultimate revenge. Like, if you leave me, Fuck you. I'm going to kill myself. Yeah. And then you're fucked forever because it's on you. Mm. Wow. Mm. And that big. Yeah, that is, but it's big for the individual, <coughs> isn't it? You know, for the individual, de- for sure. Yeah, definitely, because it's that kind of. Um, it's like the last grasp of power and control that, like, that's yeah. last ditch of certainty, isn't it? Yeah. Love and connection. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how desperate that person is to be loved. Like I say, it's sad. It's not a judgmental thing. It's just like fucking hell. If you're willing to take your life because someone doesn't want I it. think, that, I mean, obviously, the, those that are left behind as well. The, the the minds are such a cruel thing sometimes. Of the what ifs. And if I'd phoned them that day, if I'd gone and seen them that day, if I gave them one more doctor to go and see, if I went to with them to another 12-step program, you know. And you know what? On that day, you probably could have stopped them. But if on another day when you're not there, well, they'll do it, you know. Yeah, and who's to say that that life ends after you take it? You yeah, know, you, know, you know. Is there consequences for us all? I hope not. Yeah, my cousin was in Vietnam when he died, and, and the... Uh, the uh, obviously, there's monks over there, and they did his ceremony for him. And the the monk in English said, "I hope you find peace in death you couldn't find in life." I was like, "Oh, that's quite a sweet thing, you know." Yeah, because you're right. I th- people want the pain to stop, right? So yeah. I, I hope it does stop for them. Yeah, and I have faith that it d- I, th- I have faith for my that it can, it, there's, there's always a way. Yeah. You know. Even if there is more after, hopefully it's more peaceful for those who are yeah. really true. I hope so. Otherwise, how do you get out of that spiral? Because the, the, there's some theories that would say, you know, what you do in this life, like you pay for in the next. I'm like, well, if that's true, like how do you ever get out of it? Yeah. So I work. So I remember. I remember once somebody saying that to my dad once, and he said, "So my wife's suffering because something she did in the last life." And the rage that caused him, the anger that caused him. I always think know. about that, mate. You know, when people say that, and I'm always yeah. like, wow. You're like, oh, okay. That's, a, that's an interesting point of view, isn't it? Uh, but I would like to go back to the analogy of solitaire. It's just a hand you dealt. It's just a hand you dealt. It's just a hand you dealt, yeah. Yeah. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm reading about this at the minute, just using a simple mantra like, can't change it. Can't change it. Yeah, it's that reality thing, isn't it? Well, yeah, you well, yeah, you got to be careful. Every context is everything, isn't it? About changing it, because you could sort of kick back and go, "Well, I can't change it. I'll just do what I do." Then, <laughs> yeah, I suppose it's the payoff, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, it's the payoff, isn't it? What you're getting, what you're getting, what's it giving you? Because yeah. if it's not bringing you any joy and any pain, it's fair to say your habits are causing that. Whatever you're doing is causing that, maybe. And we've got to look at changing that. But then you look at people that get abused and in. DV situations what for them then okay well the m- you have to have a starting point somewhere don't you to change it like can you switch off from all this can you and just live a normal life where you're not thinking about this kind of stuff yeah so yeah yeah because that self-awareness will fuck up you know having that constant thing I think there's a thing called a uh, compassion fatigue as well um, and I, again we work with some other charities and save the children and, and other organisations that I can't I see I'm probably seeing the worst 
humanity has to offer right you know and you're thinking shit you know what i can help this person because they're, they're living it you know and a friend of mine um uh gary uh gary pitt he worked for a charity and his job was the first in the country after a natural disaster okay. like and when the tsunami hit him and four was the first there and and he just seemed like the worst thing you can imagine yeah. you know and so yeah so therapy helped him and therapy helped me as well but that's where you have to come back to those six human needs and like having more to life than than the self-development stuff like because you will miss the fruits of life then so you think you need more something more important than you just working on yourself i wouldn't say more important but something as equally as you'll commit to yeah you know because well that makes sense yeah so because otherwise you're just gonna always i think you get self-involved as well yeah yeah you know i'm working on me i'm working on me i'm working on me and like you say well, hold on there's people that could do with you they need you yeah you can help people it's like um and that's it people have these wonderful ideas about going to like save a village or go to the ukraine to help sort of thing and they've got the next door neighbor they can't get in the shop sure it's like well well, your missus or your boyfriend or whatever. Or well your that's parents. the thing, yeah. If if your family, your immediate family, you're not mm. serving them and then you go and serve you. That's where I think that order of you, us, family and the community yeah. works. Yeah, so I think, all, yeah, it's the whole... Also, we have to be careful, don't we? That <laughs> there's always another book that will give us answer. Oh, mate. Uh, big, there's serial book readers. Uh, again, I've been guilty of this myself. Yeah. I kind of race to the end so I can start the next book. It's going to tell me how to sort my shit out. So <laughs> yeah. They're there, mate. They're there, and they, they sell in they sell in abundance now. These books, self help's a big trade now. It's, it's an industry now. Yeah. So it's mental health, though. In in some way, there's a lot of coaches out there claiming to be able to fix things. Yeah. And I'm starting well. to learn. I don't think you can fix shit. Well, again, I mentioned Alan again. Like he he sort of got me around to the living in a dopamine driven world. Yes. You know because obviously. Yeah, understanding we're all driven by that dopamine so if, you know that life one like on Facebook okay your base level changes so one's not enough now yeah maybe two likes yeah you know texting someone okay texting's not enough now I need a selfie okay now I need her to get the and now I need the, and, yeah. just, and then your base level change 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 problem is though when you, that changes your dopamine's gonna run out at some point and you'll, 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 you'll crash and that's when excesses look attractive because you're constantly chasing that dopamine sure man i get that it's like the person that is like i don't know one chocolate bar a day after a few weeks that chocolate bar that was once beautiful it's mm. like that's all right but do you know what would be even better a packet chris on the side yeah yeah three weeks of that i say what i have a can of coke as well yeah. Boom, to get that dopamine up yeah we do chase it and then you have your other extremes like people will chase the ultimate high all the time and they'll get it from like extreme sports and yeah. adrenaline sports and it's a never-ending cycle of just chasing more and more yeah and for me more. that's back to that's back to significance then isn't it then you know the six human needs for me are quite yeah but, if they, but what we're saying is they need hitting right yeah uh they need, yes yeah so it's like well how do we uh, surely those baselines change too so like what i did 10 years ago for significance probably isn't worthy to keep me engaged yeah. now so it's like well how do you get your significance is it you just do good you you climb up the ladder of doing good so you help more people you does that make sense that's how you get your significance yeah. as you climb the ladder you affect more people so i win i get what i need yeah they i get to help more people yeah i suppose again it's intent isn't it it's all about your intent yeah you know and the value you bring i suppose yeah because if you don't do that that's got a shelf life hasn't it yeah i wonder how many guys feel significant yeah it's yeah it's w i i tend to have to recheck really myself with it all you know especially from the do you feel significant yeah yeah, I do, yeah it's a battle like anything I, I have to check myself a little bit do you know i'll tell you something so i took my so um i took my kids away on holiday this year on my own so um not with her mom amy great mom she's and then i was like i want to take them away you know um because otherwise i don't go away you know and i went away to a, <coughs> sorry dude i went away to um one of the resort and i was the only single dad there with my three 18 year old five year old three year old okay um only single dad there and i was looking at other parents and stuff and that was like the same stress as me dealing with kids <laughs> i'd say there was even more stress actually 
if, if I'm honest. No, I don't know if I'm honest. But I remember I met a group of, of people, and there were some dominant people in there. Like, obviously, by the pool sort of thing, you get some big lads in, in there. And there was a couple of couples that were kind of, you know, peacock feathers and stuff in, in chest out. Um, and there was this one guy in particular, a bodybuilder guy, yeah. that as soon as he came to join the group, people changed their body language, how they spoke. Uh, yeah, I'm good. No, oh, that's really interesting. And I was like, oh, okay. And he was he he was a nice guy, and he the conversation was about training quite a lot with other people. Then about you know what's important to them. And then two days later, um, a, a couple joined the group with their kids, but they were body sculptures. And even this big guy changed. I was thinking, fuck it, it's never enough, is it? It's never enough. You're not careful, you know. And then when they went away, the people I got on with were really kind of down to earth people. They came back again. It was all false enough. I'll get this round. I'll do this. Significant, significant, significant. All the time, you know. I was thinking, oh, I, I just found it really draining to yeah. be around and, so, and sad. And not judging them. I just thought, but, you know, you are enough. You've always been enough, you know. And Is that true, though? Do you think? Like, are we enough? How do we know whether we're enough? And, and a, so, on a fundamental level, I believe you are enough if you're here. Yes, there's things you've got to work on. It's like Jordan Peterson says, you know, I'd never say to my 18-year-old, you're fine as you are. Because he isn't fine as he is. He's got a work to do like we all have. But on a fundamental level, he is, you know, he's, he's enough as he is, you know, to, to, he's, he's, he's worthy of getting better, you know. So despite our insufficiencies, our, our, our fuck ups, our flaws, you know, it would be okay if things were better for you, you know. And how you do that, you have to do the work, don't you? Like back to that constant work again. Yes. You know, so when I saw these, and all these families were really successful, you know, I think there was like, a few of the families were multi millionaires as well. And the one guy, that because he worked so much physically, you could tell he didn't dedicate his time to that, which is fine. Yeah. You know, but we, and was talking about that as well. But when this bodybuilder guy come, who wasn't a millionaire, you know, it, it changed. It, it wasn't enough, you know. I remember when, I remember when Jeff Course once, and I popped in Jeff Course once to see Tony, I think. And on the course, uh, Jeff gave a free place to a lad that I still see now. And he had... Um, <laughs> he's still the same no money corruption politics da 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 out to get you fuck the system you know and he's still like it now you know he's got a family now but he's still like it and I, and um, he believed there's no money in the world and Jeff gave him a free place on his uh, master class and on the, the course there's a guy called James I still see now and he just sold his company for millions and millions of pounds and he was scared to death of it and then I remember Jeff saying to I think Matty look at that in the same room, one person saying there's no money in the world and eight people down from him, he's saying there's too much money in the world. Yeah. I thought, like, fucking hell. You know, <coughs> and that balance, isn't it, again, of if you're not careful, it will never be enough. So it's core beliefs as well, though, yeah. right? Yeah, that's core beliefs again. Some people you know? genuinely believe. I mean, I, got, uh, I bet he really believed what he was saying. Yeah, but then again, I suppose, back to where's the evidence of that, you know, because it, it's when you... I think the evidence is what you find, it's what you look for. So yeah, he'll look for all the holes in his game, won't mm. he? Do you know what I mean? He won't look at the, the people that have been there and done it. Yeah. He'll look at his situation. And his probably vision is like that. If you open that up, sure. There's I think the Bible said it a long time ago. Look for it and you shall find. Yeah. You know? yeah. So what you're looking for and seeking and what's your motivation for seeking it, you'll always find. Yeah, absolutely. You know. Good or bad. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, because um, that quote, if the snake can get to the Garden of Eden the snake can get anywhere yeah so it's definitely about your perception and yeah. what, and what the 12 steps taught me you have to be on your guard all the time you have to make sure that gate's guarded because you know those bad habits and addictions will always i think the back of the gate says you think you can flirt with your addiction and you can't you know and it will find a good day a bad day a p so how you feel with like you could almost argue it's a, it's a it's a obsession or addiction to feel that way you'll always find a reason to feel that way. There'll always be a reason to feel that way. There'll always be somebody big, you know this, some bigger, stronger, better. I know, man. It sucks look, when I learn that. Look at the grappling side. And I think it's quite free now because I love having, it is now. you know, I love yeah. having like the great Stephen Fry's and Peterson's and Alan Dovey's and Tony Summers and Matty Evans's and, you know, the, you know, and what that gave me, it's about perception, what that gave me was to go and seek it from the source all the time. So when I read like Jess' book, Okay, a place called the Red Corn in Coventry taught me to box. Fuck, I'll go there then. I did a boxing course with them. You know, 
Neil Adams taught him, okay, I'll go and start doing... So it's all about going to the source for yeah. me. And that's why books are so good. But if you look at all the books then to say, I've, never, I've not read a self-help book or a spiritual book that doesn't tend to say, now go and do the work and enjoy. I've not read, I've not read one book that says, go and read this one. Go and read this one. Go and read this one. Another, another. It's about that constant work, isn't it, for yourself? Yeah. And there's this feeling that there's <coughs> like people looking around going, there's a, you know, like, there's a guy with a better physique, there's a guy with more money. Same with when you read a book, there's a better book out there that I should be reading. There's always a better book with better help. Yeah, but is it, is it though? Better. No. Yeah. Well, maybe. But that can, so I can go on forever. Yeah, it can, yeah. And you miss the fruits, you know? Sure. Yeah. But uh, the thing with significance is sometimes it gets you what what we would see as success. So the guys who are most successful, abbreviated, are often the ones in the highest status and with most significance. Yeah. And they get, as we spoke about with Pete earlier, they get the pick, you know? Women are attracted to them, for example. They're, they're high status. They've mm. done well for themselves. They're driven, they're motivated. They've got money in the bank, they've got a nice house. They're secure. So it's that, it's almost like, well, we could look and that significance does have a benefit. Yeah, of course it does. Yeah, mm. of course it does. So is but that the thing that you should work on? Should you try and become more significant? Well, it's all about what you think that will give you. Yeah. That's where you do it. So if you think it will give you security and safety, okay, I'll do that then. You know. and nothing wrong with it, is there? Nothing wrong well, with I that. Well, I think so. You know? And my way of learning, uh, Steve, is always like, I sometimes have to go there and like buy the car to realise that it's not the significance <coughs> that I thought it would give me, for example. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I kind of have to taste what doesn't work for me to go, okay, that's cool. N not a mistake, but I've been there. I can rule that out. Well, my life's yes. no better. So this is back to the balance. So a friend of mine bought uh, a DB9 once, Aston Martin. And uh, two weeks later, he said, I should have bought a house. <laughs> yeah. It's all flat or something because it went. And then um, in my job, I remember um, going, material stuff doesn't matter. What the people I'm working with are going through, that matters the most. Sure. So I didn't work very hard to get much money in. And then I suffered. <laughs> and I think, oh, fucking hell. So it's about that balance yeah. all the time, isn't it? And what's important now, isn't it? You know? Yeah. Because if you do the right yeah. thing at the wrong time, you don't get reward, you get pain, don't you? Yeah. So it's making sure that... Everything comes back to the center. I'm starting to learn this. Like it's like, well, don't have too many material things, but you need some. Yeah, and also what? Yeah, and also why shouldn't you have nice cars yeah. and stuff? No, I get it. It's, I suppose it's what you sacrifice to get there. Yeah, at what sure. cost? Because you don't want things to be a period victory, do you? No. In the sense that a war wouldn't no. have too great a cost. And it's yeah. being it's having the skill of not attaching to those things to define success. So if you're successful because you've got a five bedroom house, because you've got a nice car, if you lose those things, you lose your success. That's not healthy. No. It's not healthy. So as long as you don't determine your success on it. So I guess it's the art of non attachment. So when people come to you then to look better naked, yeah. Why are they doing it? Well they don't often start now to come to feel better naked. That's that seems to be part of what they want in terms of I want to feel better about myself. It's more of a self respect. I think people want to start feeling like they're taking care of themselves, like they're worth taking care of. That's the main mm. thing. And it's untapped potential. Most men feel like this. They know that they're not being their best they just know so when they mm. you know bite the, the wife's head off or they're moody with the kids or they can't get off their phone or they're four stone overweight they just know that they're, they're missing out on something because they're not being their best and they might not know it might be a bit foggy but they just have that feeling <clears throat> i can do better than this i'm worth more than this i've got more to give i can offer more to my family i can live a better life mm. I, i've got more in me I just don't know how to get it out and I don't know what it looks like. Yeah. So we always start by getting a clear review. That means like, well, let's do some good stuff. Like, let's get you moving. That's um, a body, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's always the start, yeah. you know, and let's see whether we can replace the time that you're wasting with your head in Facebook with the movement. So not only are you now doing the movement, but you've reduced your amount of time where your head's distracted. So all of a sudden, the volume in your head might be turned down a little bit more. You might be able to think a little bit clearer. You might be able to think a bit more sensibly. Maybe you can be a bit more ambitious. Maybe you know what you want now because all the noise is turned down. So it's the first thing we do. And this might take up to a year. Mm. Just get good. Just get good at that. Like stop. Let, let's get some priorities in your life. What's more important? Who's more important? 
oh, so your family's more important than emails, then turn your fucking emails off. Yeah. That kind of thing is, yeah. boom. And, wh- and what do you do to, to switch off from it all? What do I do? I have a lot of um, digital free family time. Uh, I have simple rules in my life that help. So I do a lot of saunas. I do a lot of training, uh, which the rule is my phone can't be on. So I get away from the noise of the outside world. What I haven't yet mastered is just being quiet on my own. Mm. So usually I've always got a film on or some music or I'm training or I'm rolling or I'm writing or I'm reading. Yeah, It's very rare that I'm doing nothing. I haven't reached that level yet. I don't like it. I don't like being on my own with my head, with my own thoughts. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I do. So I'm kind of like, I'm, <coughs> this is the good thing about the better man. I'm like, I'm, I'm with the guys. I'm not sat on this fucking perch saying, this is how you do it, lads. And, you know, look at my life. It's great. I'm like, fellas, I'm in this game with you. I'm trying to improve myself. Yeah. I'm trying to make my life better for my mum and dad. I'm tr- you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so, that's for me, like, I mean, after like, grappling <coughs> that's when I probably I can sit with my own thoughts better you know cause I, I suppose because um, yeah I suppose what you think your own thoughts will say to you because I think we get we put too much emphasis on what being with our own thoughts is it's like meditation people find it hard to meditate I think because the perception of what meditation should yeah, be yeah. you know and you could get all spiritual about it, couldn't you but it's just like charging your phone up isn't it sure. instead and yeah. that's what grappling gives me yeah, people always think they're getting meditation wrong, which is one yeah. reason they do it. But actually, now you've just said that, it, after a big, tough training session, I do like to just sit. Yeah, see. If, so you're right. It, it sometimes be, yeah. I don't see these things. My awareness yeah. isn't up there to notice. Alex, this is you sitting and being quiet. I'm very proactive. I'm very, like, getting shit done. Yeah. So sometimes I miss some of the good stuff that I'm doing. I don't recall yeah. it or I don't see it. Hence, that's why that, that break is important because you miss the fruits, don't you? Yes, mate. Yeah. I've yeah. got it all to do, Steve. Yeah, me too. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes I think it's control, isn't it? So I think Jimone says <coughs> so many people like um, don't pick the fruits, they try and work out the roots. Yeah. You know? And he's, why would you do that for? Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, why would you? Ah, okay, it's control. I think I need control then. And it's back to then the, that voice, isn't it? Yeah. When you think, actually, I don't need to do that. I'm just going to be right selfishness yeah. and enjoy that time, actually. Mate, we've been chatting for an hour and a half. Wow. Come on. It's been cool, man. It's been a bit of a head fuck. <laughs> Sorry, dude. No, don't <laughs> don't be, mate. Don't be. I kind of yeah. knew it was going to be like that. I was ready for it and I was excited. A couple of questions, if I may. Of course you can. Finish. What's next for you? So what does the next year look like for you? Do you have any goals, ambitions, projects, visions? Yeah, so again... Uh, I like to do more for the rare, di- rare disease community with the Neiman Peak UK and other rare diseases, um, and to try and get some more resources for those suffering with l- like any kind of loss or, or mental health issue. Really, okay. what, yeah. do you, what do you mean more resources? What what, what so would it look like? So uh, again, tools for them to use. You right, know? Well, okay. one and groups as well. You know, nice. I think um, I think with any loss, group work is amazing. And I think post COVID now, those groups are slowly forming back up sort of thing yeah. and I think um, uh, that's what I'd like to kind of envision to do some more service and obviously yeah m- myself as well you know <laughs> leading that yeah well, that's pretty selfless mate that's pretty mm. amazing yeah yeah I'm gonna get some more sun as well get some more sun yeah where are you going uh, Portugal next nice. year I love and then Portugal 40 next year mate uh, yeah I'm the year after <laughs> yeah, what so are you doing for your 40 so yeah hopefully Italy and Greece that's oh, the plan. Where in Italy? Don't know yet. Love Italy. I love Italy. It's one of my favourite places in the world. Too. Yeah, food, some culture, food, history of it all. Amazing, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm in Stockholm next. I lot I've done a nice bit of travelling lately. Nice. Just got back from Vegas. Oh nice. San Francisco, that was cool. Oh nice. First time in America. Oh wow. Yeah, I like travelling. Did six weeks in Iceland last year. No, this year. Yeah, the, I saw that, yeah. yeah nice. That was all right. That's good then. Yeah, it was one of those, I'm going to get away from it all and then you take everything with you. Of course you do. <laughs> yeah, you can no. sometimes travel 10,000 miles and <laughs> still stay where you are. Mate, it was, yeah. I, I always say this on the podcast, I don't want to bore people listening, but it was exactly that. You, you kind of get off the off the plane, you unpack in your Airbnb for six weeks, you're like, okay, new environment, you know, new, new surroundings, same old me. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, oh, fuck. Yeah. I can't get away from it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yet. 
Yeah, yeah, that's what you tell yourself in your head at that time. Yeah. Yeah. I had some fucked up dreams in Iceland, real fucked up dreams, like life changing dreams, spiritual, religious dreams. Mm. Don't know where they came from. Jesus Christ dreams. Yeah, I heard in your last podcast actually. Yeah, that's quite powerful. Yeah, I think so. One of the people with the dreams and that everything in the dream is you. Everything. Yeah. In the objects. <laughs> and then you you need to sort of unpack what each object means. No, don't don't take me down this road. I can't handle any more today. Fuck <laughs> <laughs> me up already. Yeah. And then uh, last question then. What do you what do you need to work on to become a better man? I oh, fucking all what we spoke about just continue all of it. All of it. Yeah, constant work, isn't it? It is constant work. Yeah, constant work. But yeah. it but it more fun though in, in a more compassionate way. So we think sometimes constant work should be painful and it shouldn't. And it's a great guy white man to the Dal Dalai Lama Robert Bob Truman I think his name is and he says compassion should be done with more fun he said you know and he said we don't have to sit with people's misery or because that would just kill your soul you know he said sometimes we think how can I make what well, he quote was how can I make this more fun for one person my neighbor my pet dog my pet butterfly so now how small it is you know, I love that, you know. That's wicked. So, yeah, so all of it, but probably not as in, I think we're, we are tricked into, no growth and comfort, absolutely, uh -huh. okay? But you don't need it hard and painful all the time, yeah. you know, because that's missing the fruit, isn't it? So working on it all, but not as in, not as painful or as intense. I think I was a nice person when I had my dog. Mm. Responsibility is what a dog is. Yeah, it is. You've got to love it. You've got to love something. Yeah. Loving someone's hard. Get another one then. Yeah. I'm going to make sure financially I'm tight so that I can afford to have him or her looked after. Yeah. Because what I don't want to do is tie my mum and dad down with this dog and, yeah. and say, you know, I've got this dog, but I'm going off to Iceland for six weeks where you have him. Because my mum and dad have got a great life now. They don't need the hassle of a... But it's like kids though, you find the money. <coughs> there, there, there's two ways of thinking. There's yeah. the, the responsible Alex way of like, I'll get the money, which I might never get to get the dog or you go I'll get the dog and then I'll that will be another reason yeah you find the money yeah. For sure. oh yeah I know well, so, and I, I kind of know that but my house is quite nice at the minute one thing I don't miss is Benson used to slobber everywhere yeah because he was he was 85 kilos <coughs> dribbled like he would drink water and just honestly half of it would just go all over the floor exactly like kids mate yeah <laughs> then he'd <laughs> shake his head and it'd spin off onto the ceiling Oh man, and then yeah, then he'd shed hair everywhere. And Wonderful. Oh, it was beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I say, it was it was a mess. But mate, thank you. Um, no, thank you. I was thank tired you. after the last podcast. I'm really knackered now. I always oh. know it's when, it, when it's been a great conversation when I feel drained because it's just honest coming out. I appreciate yeah. your honesty, man. And uh, it's all right. I love what you do. By the way, I got to say this. I just you seem like everything you do is driven to make people's lives better. So I think if I can be a bit more like you. Um, that'll be a good step in the right direction, man. Mm. As far as you are. Yeah, but like we say, <laughs> I might be okay as I am, but there's so much more, right? Yeah. Mate, you're the man. Thank you, man. No, thank you. No.